Employers Who Torture. Welcome to our new series focusing in depth on famous crime stories of their day. Each week, we will be focusing on a crime story renowned in its time, and information is derived from historical publications. Today's episode incorporates two separate stories of employers convicted of torturing their employees. The stories take place in England between 1767 and 1829. The two stories of Elizabeth Brownrigg and Esther Hibner the Elder remain shocking even now and fall under the category Employers Who Torture. We hope you enjoy the show. Stories of employers doing horrible things to their employees is not a new phenomenon. In this episode, we focus on actual torment by the employer on their employee, which includes employees in an apprenticeship, where legally the employer was expected to give a certain amount of care to their apprentice. Although mistreatment of one's employees was not particularly shocking at this time with little recourse to the employee, these cases were considered particularly shocking for the extreme nature of the cruelty. The employees were tortured to death. Elizabeth Brownrigg, 4th of September, 1767 we start our review of employers who torture with the infamous case of Mrs. Brownrigg. This case from 1767 was still referred to 100 years later. It was that infamous. In short, Mrs. Brownrigg had a number of apprentices with their particulars raised in the trial. They were Mary Mitchell, Mary Jones and Mary Clifford. The girls were originally orphaned and were apprenticed to the Brownrigs as an alternative to the expense of their paying for domestic help. The cruelty inflicted on the girls is extreme and include whippings on bare backs to the point where the whippings had to be taken over by another due to weariness, lack of food and water, lack of clothing, regular beatings were only a few of the tortures inflicted on the girls as recounted in the press of the day. From the Newgate calendar, the long and excruciating torture in which this inhuman woman kept the innocent object of her remorseless cruelty before she finished the long premeditated murder more engaged the attention and roused the indignation of all ranks than any criminal in the whole course of our melancholy narratives. Elizabeth Brownrigg was married to James Brownrigg, a plumber, who, after being seven years in Greenwich, came to London and took a house in Flower de Luce Court, Fleet Street, where he carried on a considerable share of business and had a little house at Islington for an occasional retreat. She had been the mother of 16 children and having practised midwifery was appointed by the overseers of the poors of St Dunstan's Parish to take care of the poor women in the workhouse, which duty she performed to the entire satisfaction of her employers. Mary Jones. Mary Mitchell, a poor girl of the precinct of Whitefriars, was put apprentice to Mrs. Brownrigg in the year 1765. And at about the same time, Mary Jones, one of the children of the Foundling Hospital, was likewise placed with her in the same capacity, and she had other apprentices. As Mrs. Brownrigg received women to lie in privately, these girls were taken with a view of saving the expense of women servants. At first, the poor orphans were treated with some degree of civility, but this was soon changed for the most savage barbarity. 
Having laid Mary Jones across two chairs in the kitchen, she whipped her with such wanton cruelty that she was occasionally obliged to desist through mere weariness. This treatment was frequently repeated, and Mrs. Brownrigg used to throw water on her when she had done whipping her, and sometimes she would dip her head into a pail of water. The room appointed for the girl to sleep in adjoined the passage leading to the street door, and as she had received many wounds on her head, shoulders, and various parts of her body, she determined not to bear such treatment any longer if she could effect her escape. Mary Jones' Escape Observing that the key was left in the street door when the family went to bed, she opened the door cautiously one morning and escaped into the street. Thus freed from her horrid confinement, she repeatedly inquired her way to the foundling hospital till she found it, and was admitted. After describing in what manner she had been treated and showing the bruises that she had received, the child having been examined by a surgeon who found her wounds to be of a most alarming nature, the governors of the hospital ordered Mr. Plumtree, their solicitor, to write to James Brownrigg, threatening a prosecution if he did not give a proper reason for the severities exercised upon the child. No notice of this having been taken, and the governors of the hospital thinking it Imprudent to indict at common law, the girl was discharged in consequence of an application to the Chamberlain of London. So, it would seem that although Mary Jones's statements could be backed up by the scars and bruises on her body, the authorities decided to take no action against the Brown Rigs. Instead, the authorities bound another orphan to the Brown Riggs, Mary Clifford. The Newgate calendar continues, Mary Clifford. The other girl, Mary Mitchell, continued with her mistress for the space of a year, during which she was treated with equal cruelty, and she had also resolved to quit her service. Having escaped out of the house, she was met in the street by the younger son of Brown Rigg, who forced her to return home, where her sufferings were greatly aggravated on account of her escape. Mary Clifford Torture In the interim, the overseers of the precinct of Whitefriars bound Mary Clifford to Brownrigg. It was not long before she experienced similar cruelties to those inflicted on the other poor girls, and possibly still more severe. She was frequently tied up, naked and beaten with a hearth broom, a horsewhip or a cane, till she was absolutely speechless. This poor girl having a natural infirmity, the mistress could not permit her to lie in a bed, but placed her on a mat in a coal hole that was remarkably cold. However, after some time, a sack and a quantity of straw formed her bed instead of the mat. During her confinement in this wretched situation, she had nothing to subsist on but bread and water, and her covering during the night consisted only of her own clothes, so that she sometimes lay almost perished with the cold. On a particular occasion, when she was almost starving with hunger, she broke open a cupboard in search of food, but found it empty, and on another occasion she broke down some boards in order to procure a draught of water. Though she was thus pressed for the humblest necessities of life, Mrs. Brownrigg determined to punish her with rigour for the means that she had taken to supply herself with them. On this, she caused the girl to strip to the skin, and during the course of a whole day, while she remained naked, she repeatedly beat her with the butt-end of a whip. In the course of this most inhuman treatment, a jack-chain was fixed around her neck, 
the end of which was fastened to the yard door, and then it was pulled as tight as possible, without strangling her. A day being passed in the practice of these savage barbarities, the girl was remanded to the coal hole at night, her hands being tied together and the chain still remaining about her neck. The husband being obliged to find his wife's apprentices in wearing apparel, they were repeatedly stripped naked and kept so for whole days if their garments happened to be torn. Sometimes Mrs. Branrig then resolved on uncommon severity, used to tie their hands with a cord and draw them up to a water pipe which ran across the ceiling in the kitchen, but that giving way she desired her husband to fix a hook in the beam through which a cord was drawn and their arms being extended she used to horsewhip them till she was weary and till the blood flowed at every stroke. The eldest son one day directed Mary Clifford to put up a half-tester bedstead, but the poor girl was unable to do it, on which he beat her till she could no longer support his severity, and at another time, when the mother had been whipping her in the kitchen till she was absolutely tired, the son renewed the savage treatment. Mrs. Brownrigg would sometimes seize the poor girl by the cheeks, and forcing the skin down violently with her fingers, caused the blood to gush from her eyes. Mary Clifford asks for help. Mary Clifford, unable to bear these repeated severities, complained of her hard treatment to a French lady who lodged in the house, and she, having re represented the impropriety of such behaviour to Mrs. Brownrigg, the inhuman monster flew at the girl and cut her tongue in two places with a pair of scissors. On the morning of the 13th of July, this barbarous woman went into the kitchen and, after obliging Mary Clifford to strip to the skin, drew her up to the staple and through her body was an entire sore from former bruises, yet this wretch renewed her cruelties with her accustomed severity. After whipping her till the blood streamed down her body, she let her down and made her wash herself in a tub of cold water. Mary Mitchell, the other poor girl, being present during this transaction. While Clifford was washing herself, Mrs. Branrigg struck her on the shoulders already sore with former bruises, with the butt-end of a whip, and she treated the child in this manner five times in the same day. Mrs. Brownrigg's deeds become known. The poor girl's wounds now began to show evident signs of mortification, and it is probable that she might have been privately buried, and the murderous escaped detection but for the following circumstances. Mary Clifford's mother-in-law, who had resided some time in the county, came to town and inquired after the child, and being informed that she was placed at Brownrigg's, she went thither, but was refused admittance by Mrs. Brownrigg, who even threatened to carry her before the Lord Mayor if she came there to make further disturbances. Information to Mary Clifford's mother-in-law. Hereupon the mother-in-law was going away when Mrs. Deacon, the wife of Mr. Deacon, baker at the adjoining house, called her in and informed her that she and her family had often heard moaning and groaning issuing from the brown rigs house and that she suspected the apprentices were treated with unwarrantable severity. Mrs. Deacon likewise promised to exert herself to come at the truth of the affair. At this juncture, Mr. Brownrigg, going to Hampstead on business, bought a hog which he sent home. This hog was put into a covered yard to which there was a skylight, which it was thought necessary to remove in order to give air to the animal. 
neighbour servants watching the brown rig house. As soon as it was known that the skylight was removed, Mr Deacon ordered his servant to watch, in order, if possible, to discover the girls. Deacon's servant maid, looking from a window, saw one of the girls stooping down on which she called her mistress, and she desired the attendance of some of the neighbours, who, having been witnesses of the shocking scene, some men got upon their leads and dropped bits of dirt to induce the girl to speak to them, but she seemed wholly incapable. Demanding to see Mary Clifford, Hereupon Mrs. Deacon sent to the girl's mother-in-law, who, going to the overseers who had placed out the child, they called on Mr. Grundy, one of the overseers of St. Dunstan's, and all of them going together, they demanded a sight of Mary Clifford. But Brownrigg told them that he knew no such person. But if they wanted to see Mary, meaning Mary Mitchell, they might, and accordingly produced her. Mary Mitchell instead of Mary Clifford. Mr. Deacon's servant now declared that Mary Mitchell was not the girl who had been seen in the shocking situation above mentioned, on which Mr. Grundy sent for a constable to search the house, which was done, but no discovery was then made. Mr. Brownrigg threatened highly, but Mr. Grundy, with the spirit that became the officer of a parish, took Mary Mitchell with him to the workhouse, where, on the taking off her leathern bodice, it stuck so fast to her wounds that she shrieked with the pain. But on being treated with great humanity and told that she would not be sent back to Brownrigg, she gave an account of the horrid treatment that she and Mary Clifford had sustained, and confessed that she had met the latter on the stairs just before they came to the house. Finding Mary Clifford On this, Mr Grundy and some others returned to the house to make a strict search, on which Brownrigg sent for a lawyer in order to intimidate them, and even threatened a prosecution unless they immediately quitted the house. And terrified by these threats, Mr Grundy sent for a coach to carry Brownrigg to the compter on which the latter promised to produce the girl in half an hour, if the coach was discharged. This being consented to, the girl then produced from a cupboard under a beauset in the dining room. It is not in language to describe the miserable appearance of this poor girl maid. Almost her whole body was ulcerated. Being taken to the workhouse, an apothecary was sent for, who pronounced her to be in danger. Mrs. Brownrigg and son escaped. Brownrigg was conveyed to Wood Street Compter, but his wife and son made their escape, taking them a gold watch and some money. Mr. Brownrigg was carried before Alderman Crosby, who committed him and ordered the girls to be taken to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, where Mary Clifford died within a few days. The coroner's inquest was summoned and found a new verdict of willful murder against James and Elizabeth Brownrigg and John, their son. In the meantime, Mrs Brownrigg and her son shifted from place to place in London, bought clothes in Ragfair to disguise themselves, and then went to Wandsworth, where they took lodgings in the house of Mr Dunbar, who kept a chandler's shop. Mrs Brownrigg and son discovered and caught. This Chandler, happening to read a newspaper on the 15th of August, saw an advertisement which so clearly described his lodgers that he had no doubt that they were the murderers. A constable went to the house and the mother and son were conveyed to London. The Trial At the ensuing sessions at the Old Bailey, the father, the mother and son were indicted when Elizabeth Brownrigg, after a trial of eleven hours, was found guilty of murder and ordered for execution, but the man and his son, being acquitted of the higher charge, were detained to take their trials for a misdemeanour of which they were convicted and imprisoned 
for the space of six months. After a sentence of death was passed on Mrs. Brownrigg, she was attended by a clergyman to whom she confessed the enormity of her crime and acknowledged the justice of the sentence by which she had been condemned. The parting between her and her husband and her son on the morning of her execution was affecting beyond description. The son falling on his knees, she bent herself to him and embraced him. The husband was kneeling on the other side. She also kneeled down, and having besought the Almighty to have mercy on her soul, said, Dear James, I beg that God for Christ's sake will be reconciled, and that he will not leave me, forsake me, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment. On her way to the place of execution, the people expressed their abhorrence of her crime in terms which, though not proper for the occasion, testified their astonishment that such a wretch could have existed. They even prayed for her damnation instead of her salvation. They doubted not but that the devil would fetch her and hoped that she would go to hell. Such were the sentiments of the mob. At the place of execution, this miserable woman joined in prayers with the ordinary of Newgate, whom she desired to declare to the multiple that she confessed her guilt and acknowledged the justice of her sentence. After execution, her body was put into a hackney coach, conveyed to Surgeon's Hall, dissected and anatomized, and her skeleton was hung up in Surgeon's Hall. From the extreme torture inflicted by Mrs. Brownrigg in 1767, we jump to 1829 and the Hibners, mother and daughter. Again, this case involves apprentices. The children are impoverished and orphaned and at the mercy of those who are paid to teach them a trade. From the Broadsides, April 1829, particulars of the trial and execution of Esther Hibner, the elder, for the willful murder of Francis Colpitt, a parish apprentice, who was executed this morning at the Old Bailey on the 4th of April, 1829. Esther Hibner, the elder, was indicted with her daughter and Anne Robinson, their forewoman, for the willful murder of Francis Colpitt, a child only ten years of age. Mr. Boland stated the case to the jury. The deceased, who was only ten years old, was a pauper and was apprenticed to the prisoner Esther Hibner, the elder, who resided at Platt Terrace, Pancras Road, by the overseers of St. Martin's Parish to learn the business of fabricating timber work. For our listeners, timber work was white stitching on white gowns, a type of embroidery. Francis was apprenticed on the 7th of April, 1828, and and in the month of October, following her apprenticeship, a system of the most cruel and unnatural treatment was commenced by the prisoners towards the unfortunate deceased and other children who were placed under the prisoner's care by St. Martin's and other parishes. They were not allowed sufficient sustenance. They were compelled to rise to begin work at three or four in the morning. They were kept working at night until 11 o'clock, sometimes two in the morning and sometimes all night. They had scarcely any bed to lie on and frequently during the most inclement season their nesting place was the flooring and their only covering was an old rag. The prisoners and their family had good bedding and clothes and and every comfort that they desired. The children were not permitted to go out to obtain necessary air and exercise and thus the cruel treatment they had experienced had terminated fatally with three of them. The child, which was subject to the present indictment, Francis Colpitt, had been reduced to such a deplorable condition that her feet mortified, and this, combined with the bursting of an absence on the lungs, 
brought on by the ill treatment the child had experienced, occasioned her death. The breakfast which was allowed the children was a slice of bread and a cup of milk, and if they were indulged with this luxury, they had no more food all the day. Sometimes the elder Hibner said the deceased and the other children had not earned their breakfast, and then a few potatoes were given them in the midst of the morning, and nothing more afterwards till the following morning. Nine pounds of potatoes were divided amongst the whole family, which consisted of twelve persons. They were allowed meat only once a fortnight, and on Sundays the children were locked in the kitchen, the windows of which were closed. It could be proven that the younger prisoner, Hibner, had taken the deceased Francis Colpitt from the frame and knocked her down on the floor. She had then taken Francis up and knocked her down again. When the elder prisoner was informed that Francis was lying in a room ill, instead of affording her that protection which she was bound to do, she replied, let her lie there. Frances, then in that state that she could scarcely crawl about the house, was told by the younger Hibner to clean the stairs. She attempted to do it, but fell exhausted and was unable to accomplish the task. The younger Hibner then took Frances up the stairs and flogged her with the cane and a rod, and afterwards sent her down to finish the stairs. When Frances came down, she was unable from weakness to go to the proper place to obey the calls of nature, and wetted the stairs. When Hibner, the younger, discovered it, she rubbed the child's nose and face in it, and afterwards plunged her head into a pail of water. The prisoner Robinson, the forewoman, who was standing by, encouraged the younger Hibner to commit this violence, and said, Curse her, do it again, and that will finish her. The children often cried for food, and, and to satisfy the cravings of nature, had eaten the meat that was brought in for the day, and also some pieces of meat which they picked out of the wash that was obtained for feeding the pig. It would be proved also that all the prisoners had beaten Francis, sometimes with a cane, sometimes with a rod, and sometimes with a shoe evidence. Three of the unfortunate children were called to give evidence, who fully supported the statement made by counsel. Mr. Wright, a surgeon, said that he saw the deceased Francis Colpitt. She had sores on her feet, and her toes were mortifying and dropping off. After death, he examined the body and found that the lungs were nearly destroyed by abscess, and the body was otherwise deceased. There was also several bruises on the outside of the body. The real cause of death was the abscess on the lungs and the mortification of the feet. These were produced by the want of food and exercise and the improper treatment which the child had received and two other surgeons gave similar testimony. Defence On being called upon their defence, the elder Hibner said, she would leave her defence in the hands of her daughter. The daughter said that the children had sworn falsely. She stated that the children had been treated with the greatest kindness by herself and her mother, and there was not the slightest grounds for the accusation which had been referred against them. Robinson declared that what was alleged against her was false. She was only employed in the business and went home every night at eight. Two witnesses were called who, instead of giving evidence in favour of the prisoners, spoke of their inhumanity to the children. The verdict. Mr. Baron Garrow summoned up the evidence in a feeling and impressive manner, and the jury retired for one hour. When they returned into the court, they found Esther Hibner, the elder, guilty, and acquitted the other two. The recorder then passed sentence of death upon the prisoner, during which time she stood 
at the bar unmoved. But when mention was made of her body being given for dissection, a slight convulsive tremor agitated her frame. But it was soon over, and she walked from the bar to the prison as firmly as the jailer who conducted her. Execution. At the usual hour this morning, the wretched woman was led to the fatal spot and was soon after launched into eternity. In the view of an immense number of spectators, chiefly females, whose groans and hisses the prisoner must have heard. Executed 13th of April, 1829. The daughter and Robinson are to be tried for assaulting the other children, and we hope they will be severely punished. That concludes this episode of Employers Who Torture. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. There is no cost to you, and it really helps to support us. Just tap on the subscribe button that pops up if you haven't already subscribed. We have listened to our listeners' feedback and are working on increasing our longer episodes to four times a week. They will be uploaded on a Tuesday. Wednesdays, with our new series, we are launching Whitechapel Wednesdays. Thursdays, and our new Serial Killer Saturdays. With shorter, but we believe still interesting stories uploaded on the other days of the week. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs> <laughs>